In this age of AI, is robo-advice better than human advice? Then how can you get your finances in order after a death or divorce? And what it takes to fund an Olympic dream? All this and more on today's episode of The Wealthy Life. investors expect going forward as a wealth management experience? With us today is Michael King, a finance professor and contributor to the book, The Technological Revolution in Financial Services. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here, Sybil. Now, this is quite a book and this is a hot topic because things are changing rapidly. Yes. What do you see as the biggest changes when it comes to wealth management advice? What's that experience looking like in the future? Well, What's happening with financial services in general and with wealth management is that we're using a lot more technology. So what the book is really focused on is how the whole industry is being transformed. And it all has to do with how we're actually accessing our financial services. A lot of it used to be done face to face through your branches. And now what we're seeing, and this is true particularly during the pandemic, is people are doing their banking, they're investing, they're lending, they're doing it on their phone and online. You don't need to go anywhere. No. I, I still don't understand the people who like to go into the bank branches, for example, to do a deposit or a withdrawal, other than it is nice to see people. It is. And you know, it's amazing what we've been able to do with, with just our phones and Branches are really becoming the time when you get to interact with someone, yes. when you've got an important life event, such as maybe a mortgage, or maybe you have to set up um, something, uh, a plan for your finances. Yes. But the day-to-day -day stuff, the routine stuff, we're doing it now electronically. So what are some of the main differences between what can be done using AI or technology versus what does a human specialist or advisor offer? Yeah, I think this is like a big misconception or myth that people have that computers are somehow going to replace people. Mm -hmm. Computers are going to be useful for doing repetitive, boring tasks, for sort of managing paperwork, back office processes, but people still like to see each other face to face, particularly when it comes to dealing with their finances. Yes. Finances are very important for people and trust and relationships are continuing to be very important. Well, one of the things that worries me most is it's garbage in, garbage out. So our viewers, if whatever they're putting into the system, that's the information that's gonna be used. But what if the wrong information is being input or not enough information is being input? When you think about wealth management advice, it's complex. It's not as simple as just building an investment portfolio, it may be, answering questions like, how long will your money last? How do you send your son or daughter to post-secondary education? Mm -hmm. What about if you have a family member that has a disability? So those are some of the things that I see, and correct me if I'm wrong, but really where the human touch comes into play. Absolutely, I mean, I think people have to remember that computers are programmed to do certain things. They don't think. We have this idea, artificial intelligence, somehow the computer is smart. Computers basically will follow rules that have been given but human lives are complex, our finances are messy, and so often you need an expert's advice to help guide you. Now that's not to say that there are some things that we can't use computers for, and there are uh, some very useful ways that we can make the experience cheaper, faster, better. Yes. Coming back to your example about going to the branch, why do you need to go to the branch to deposit a check? If you can do it online, on your phone, from the comfort of your home. Right. It's, so it's, why do people do it? It's Well, now we're finding, and it used to be more younger people, more millennials. Now everyone is figuring out how to do it because of the, the need to sort of shelter, stay at home. And so if you are going to go out, you're going to make that trip for something that's particularly important or special where you do have to speak to a person. Yeah, which is great. Yeah. So when it comes to getting advice from someone and, and the fees that you're paying for that, yeah. how has this evolution of advice impacted fees and, and where's it going in the future? I mean, everyone wants everything for free, but yeah. that's not gonna happen. No, it's not. <laughs> so let's talk about fees because fees is an interesting one. For a long time, wealth management, people have not really understood what their fees are. And with regulations that came into place, we saw how much we were paying. Yes. Okay. With 
these sort of robo advisors where you're you're making investments uh, electronically through an online platform, yeah. you're paying fees. Your fees are lower, but your service is lower. So it makes sense that if it's it's relatively easy to do electronically and you can do it in um, a cost-efficient manner, a robo-advisor may be a first step. Right, and I would agree with that. And you get what you pay for, but yeah. people have to start somewhere and dealing with a full service, high profile expert, yeah. uh, professional, may be a little bit more expensive than someone just starting out can afford. Absolutely. You know, so yeah. use use the computers for that. So if you were seeing fees shift in the future, mm -hmm. just sit back and have a look at what value are you getting for the fees you're paying, as opposed to just looking at the fees themselves. Would that yeah. be good advice? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first thing, if you have a financial advisor, you should be asking them what your fees are, and they're going to tell you. And if a financial advisor is worth the advice they're giving you, you're going to be very happy to pay the fees. The second thing is that they're going to direct you to ways that you can save money that may not be obvious to you. And they're also going to be better at giving you advice for things that can't be programmed, sort of what we would call behavioral advice, meaning discipline and savings, not panicking when there's volatility in markets, looking at things that are not as simple as simply investing in stocks and bonds, but maybe planning for retirement, planning your mortgage, looking at all your assets together, life insurance, trusts. So I like to say that robo-advisors are good for a very, very small slice of what you do, but there's a lot of other things that comes into financial planning and wealth management, which you know better than anyone else. Well, this has been informative. What's the one thing that people can do after watching this segment? I think people should try downloading an app from their bank so they can get used to using it to do the day-to-day -day experiences, but also try to use electronic forms instead of paper forms and move yourself into this digital kind of way of managing your life, your finances. So baby steps, start with an app. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. When we return, can you afford to be suddenly solo? to your finances if you lost your spouse through death or divorce. Portfolio manager Trixie Rovine will walk us through the steps you should take today to ensure you're financially secure in any situation. Trixie, welcome. Great to have you on The Wealthy Life. Thanks for having me, Sybil. This is great. So what are the main implications that people need to be aware of? What happens financially when you lose a loved one? Well, that is the hardest problem right there is we don't know what we don't know. So until you've experienced it either personally or with clients like I do in my profession, preparation is number one. And it's not something people are really willing to do because it's not like planning for a holiday or vacation. Not that we're doing much of that right now anyways, but it is preparing yourself now in two ways. And that is from an uh, income point of view, what happens to my income yep. and expenses. What happens to my expenses? Do they increase? Do they decrease? And can number one cover number two? You know what? That is critically important. And you're right. People don't like thinking about it. It is way more fun planning a two-week vacation to somewhere tropical than it is to plan for, gee, what would happen if my spouse left me or passed away? Nobody wants to think about it. But when they don't think about it, now they're dealing with a double whammy, that emotional turmoil combined with then financial ruin in some cases or financial stress. I just can't imagine what people would go through in that situation. So what do you so think that, they should do? Like what, what is the planning? What is some of the prep work that people can do in advance? 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Sybil, is learning when you're grieving, whether it's the loss of a spouse because they've passed away or the loss of a spouse because they're suddenly no longer in your life, that's not the time to be learning. You want to learn before. So, um, you know, get yourself some information, whether it's working with an advisor or going online. But the two simplest things that you can do is prepare a list of all your expenses. What does it cost to live your life? You know, what what the things you spend on? And then number two is how much money is coming in from various sources, either yourself and your spouse So should something happen to your spouse and you lose a quarter or a half of that income, can you handle the expenses? The other part that I've, I don't want to say I've missed it, but you also want to keep track of what you own and what you owe, which is also called the net worth statement, basically your assets and your liabilities. So when we look at that Mm -hmm. income and expenses, it's almost like everybody should do two different worksheets. You should do a cash flow needs analysis based on as a couple and then pretend something happened to one or the other. What now does each individual person need if they're on their own? And it's not as easy as it sounds because they might decide to stay in the family home. Maybe they have to buy a second home. And then the income piece of it is what income carries on and what stops. So in the event of a divorce, maybe there is some spousal support Maybe there's not. And it's better to plan assuming there's not, I always say. Um, and yeah. in the event of death, maybe there's a, you know, the pension income. Maybe there's a benefit there that carries on a survivor benefit, but maybe there's not. So once people have that number figured out of how much they need, then they'll know if they're covered or not. Is that right? Exactly. And you may want to do, like you pointed out, various options. Um, I've gone through a divorce myself and I can tell you, I did exactly what you said. The joint expenses, the single expenses, if I was on my own, if I was still together, if I was in my matrimonial home, if I was in a new home, owning versus renting. Now I am uh, someone that does this for a living. So I'm going to say it was easy for me to go through that. But I will tell you one thing that I had a colleague share with me when he saw how much I was agonizing. And he said, if you were doing this with a client, what would you tell them? And I said, easy. I'm like, just sell the home. And he said, why are you agonizing? It is interesting how emotionally involved you get in your own affairs. So I do encourage people to work with someone who's neutral to a certain extent, but can also see things objectively because it's easy to get caught up in the emotional aspects of your finances. It absolutely is. And you know what? There's a great sense of independence planning in advance. And for those of you watching at home that would like to know where to start, we have a planning for the unexpected workbook. So contact us at The Wealthy Life to get a copy. Trixie, thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much, Sybil. I really appreciate it. After the break, we're talking to Simon Whitfield about funding your Olympic dream. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Do you know what it takes to be an Olympian? Today we're talking to Olympic gold medalist Simon Whitfield. Simon, great to have you on The Wealthy Life today. Thanks for having me. This is terrific. So an Olympic gold medal in the sport of triathlon, what was that like to get there? Uh, it was a long journey. I uh, started in Kingston, Ontario and ended up in Australia. And uh, it was just the story of a kid who was just preoccupied with this thing he loved to do and was able to take it to the top of a podium. Which was, and uh, how old were you when you figured out this is what you wanted to do? I was pretty, I just liked being outside and competing <laughs> at anything, that, whatever it might be. Uh, very early on, I started triathlon at age 11 and continued on doing it for four Olympics uh, wow. from there. So what do you think is the right mindset of a young athlete wanting to get to that level of sport? 
Uh, it's all preoccupation. It's an ability to main, remain solely focused on one objective and to be fully immersed in that, whatever it is, music, art, theater, in this case, sport. It's just a, an ability to be disciplined and, and completely and utterly preoccupied. Right, because it is a lot of effort and it's a lot of hours. How many hours a day on average would you train? Um, our training regimen was in that kind of six hour range, but it was, it's more than that. It wasn't just six hours of training. It was, again, it was just this, you, it, when you woke up, it was the first thing you thought about. And when you went to bed, it was the last thing you thought about. And you did this day after day after day, year after year. So was, not a lot of time for other relationships, I'm assuming, during the training process. No, I mean, but with they, within that environment, the environment that you create, um, your, whether it would be your training squad or what have you, you still, you had support, you had friendships and you had relationships, but your day revolved around and the commitment was to this one objective. Now, how do, you, how do people pay for this? Because that's a lot of training in a day. It's almost like having a full-time job because that's the focus or even more than a full-time job. Um, but people still need to put a roof over their head and food on the table. Mm -hmm. So what are some common ways that people are able to do that? Yeah, I think everybody has their own. You know, some people are going to school while doing it too. So uh, in, in my case, it was working summer jobs or through the off season, working a job and in the beginning. And then as races and you know, I was able to accumulate prize money, I was slowly able to afford to go to more things. But I think more importantly, it was just about having this very simple lifestyle that just, it meant that everything was accounted for to work towards being able to be preoccupied. And that right. may mean less work, it may mean at other times more work, but it always came back to the same thing, which was to be uh, wholly and fully engaged. Right, and that means keeping your expenses low, mm -hmm. if you can. So you don't need a fancy residence, you don't need a sports car, mm -hmm. you don't need to eat out all the time. Well, you're probably eating super healthy at home anyways during the training routine. So what are some ways, aside from working, is there grants available for people to help pay for things? Yeah, there are grants available. They're across the country and within local municipalities, there would be grants available. There's always a way that's that kind of expression comes back to to just figure it out. Um, there is support out there, and it, this, there, if there's this consideration that it will take a while, that's the reality of right. it. Um, but the people who do make it to that Olympic level, they just fig found a way to figure it out. In some case, they had uh, backing from maybe friends and family. In other cases, they just figured out a different method to have right. to do it. And then, and, and what are some of the other expenses associated? I mean, obviously roof overhead, food on the table, mm -hmm. but what about gear and, and equipment and travel, I guess? Do you, how many competitions do you need to do? That would be the overwhelming expenses for this travel. But even then, I mean, if people are able to put themselves in a position where they can qualify for races, tournaments, events that they need to get to, then that funding will often find a way to find them. Right. So they may not be able to go to all the competitions that they wanted to, but there's always this way, there's always this path right. forward to find that one competition, to put your name on the team, to be on the next team, to make it to the next level. So aside from family, friends, maybe apply for grant, maybe the community steps in to support you and working to pay for it, that's great. But viewers, if you're wanting to support a young athlete, maybe there's a way they can help. Where would they go? Yeah, here in Victoria, you can go to 944.ca. It's the, it's the legacy fund from the Commonwealth Games, and it's funded national, provincial, and local sports organizations for many, many years now and continues to. And if people want to make a donation, that's the place to do it, for sure. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's true. Simon, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Don't go away, because up next, we'll cover what RESP savings can be used for. It's more than you think.
Welcome back. Thanks for your emails, tweets, and messages. Today's question is from Jamar. Dear Sybil, if we set up a registered education savings plan for our grandkids, do they have to use the money for university tuition only, or can it be used for other things? Well, Jamar, it's a great question, and most importantly, I'm glad you're asking about the RESP, because did you know you get 20% or more free money from the government, up to certain limits, of course, for all contributions you make to the plan? So definitely a great way to save for post-secondary education. Now, to answer your question about pulling the money out, it can be used for a number of education-related expenses. Tuition, books, rent, groceries, travel, and other just living expenses. So it doesn't just have to be used for tuition. The other benefit to know is it can be used for university, it can be used for college, it can be used for a lot of different trades. So someone who wants to be an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, a hairdresser, a lot of these are also covered in eligible expenses. You just need to meet certain minimum course requirements and you have to have proof of enrollment. There are also some limitations on how much money you can pull out at the beginning. But essentially, all of these details can be found on Canada.ca's website if you search RESP. So the short answer to your question is yes, you can use the money for more than just tuition. And that wraps up this edition of The Wealthy Life, helping you make smarter financial decisions. Join the Wealthy Life Club by becoming a member at thewealthylife.com. You'll get access to everything you need to live your wealthy life.